this little video clip just because uh, te technically it'll be easier if we run it first. Okay. So, you have it set up here? Okay. Does that focus a little bit? Good morning. So everybody wants to and expects to live a long and extended life. But nobody wants to get old. And it's because aging is associated with pain and debility and dependence. The fact is we spend almost three trillion dollars on health care. But the results are actually quite disappointing. It's interesting to note that if you're an adult today, you can expect to live a little longer than an adult would in 1900. Now it's interesting that life expectancy has gone up. 31 years. Life expectancy in 1900 was 47, today it's 78. That's 31 years increase. And yet, if you notice here, an adult of 65 years old can only expect to live seven years longer, and an adult of 85 years old can expect to live two years longer. So where's the 24-year difference? It's because of reduction in infant mortality. So. Infant mortality used to be over 160 per thousand in uh, 1900. Today it's, it's less than seven. So for every child that doesn't die in infancy, and you add 78 man years to the average, it shifts the curve to the right. One in five kids used to die from mostly waterborne illnesses, you know, in infancy or early childhood. Now this change in infant mortality has little to do with the miracles of modern medicine. The things you think about, sulfur medications, um, penicillin, these things didn't come in till long after this curve had taken place. 1937 for sulfur drugs, penicillin not till 1940. Those, those infant mortality curves had long been reduced. The changes that are associated with these infant mortality changes. Here you see this is how much longer an 85 year old, a 65 year old. This difference here, this increase, is due almost entirely to improvements in public hygiene. So, improved water and food hygiene, less malnutrition, reduced overcrowding, and less deadly medical care. There's 109 humans that have lived on this planet. And there are 7.3 billion humans alive today. There have been exactly five humans that have been well documented to live to be 117 or older. So your odds of getting to over 117 are about 1 in 20 billion. You're not going to live longer than your genetic potential. But you can certainly die sooner. And more importantly, you can become debilitated. So what we really need to focus on not, is not just life expectancy, which is maximally genetically determined, but 
functional life expectancy, healthy life expectancy. The average person has 9.4 years of debility. 9.4 years of debility. And if we just use being, whether you're healthy or not, the average person is spending between 15 and 18 years unhealthy. So the important thing would be to try to reduce the period of debility, increase healthy life expectancy. Now, we're spending trillions of dollars in the United States, presumably, to do that, but the results are disappointing. You notice the United States here, both for life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, trail much of the world. When we look at things like disability, what actually is disabling people before they die? We find there's things like arthritis and joint pain, back pain, heart problems, lung problems, diabetes. These are different than the ultimate causes of death, which is dominated by heart disease, cancer, and stroke. It's also important to differentiate leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, from actual causes of death, which are tobacco, poor diet, physical inactivity, and the use of alcohol. So the actual reasons why these leading causes of death are actually occurring. This is causes of death in 1900. You see infectious disease, mostly waterborne illness, dominating that. Now infectious disease is mild, but we have replaced that with heart disease and cancer. It's not that we're living so much longer, it's just we're dying from different causes. And the majority of the health determinants as a percentage of our mortality are actually things we can do something about, choices we can make. It's interesting when you look at ultimate cause of death, tobacco leads the list. We might say, why does tobacco do such an effective job at killing and debilitating people prematurely? And the reason is tobacco is very effective at affecting all the different organ systems of the body. Unlike high blood pressure, which only primarily affects the cardiovascular system, tobacco affects the lungs, it affects the kidneys, it affects virtually every system in the body, which is why they can say, well, 80% of smokers never get lung cancer. How bad can it be? It's because they die from heart disease before they live long enough to grow the tumor. If you wanted a cancer-safe cigarette, all you'd have to do is make sure everybody died of heart disease early enough, and then you could market it appropriately. Isn't it interesting here, alcohol is number three on the ultimate causes of death because it also affects virtually every organ system of the body. But today, people are trying to market it as some kind of health food. They say, well, if you don't drink now, you should start. You know, are you worried about your heart? Drink wine because wine has a small amount of resteratrol in it. There's a little bit of an antioxidant that's found in the skin of a grape that hasn't been completely destroyed when you turn it into alcohol. And based on that residual trace of uh, antioxidant, they're trying to market it to you as some kind of health food, when in reality, alcohol is highly detrimental and a leading cause of death. Today, the, the syndrome that really dominates uh, industrialized countries is, could be called metabolic syndrome. It involves abdominal obesity, high lipids, high blood pressure, high blood sugar. This is the thing that's getting uh, the majority of people. And we are getting fatter. Uh, it's amazing, how, actually, how efficient we are at increasing the strategic fat reserves in the waist and hits of Americans. In 1986, slightly after I went into practice, there wasn't a single state in the United States that had more than 14% of the population obese. But every year, what's happened is obesity has begun to increase. You notice they had to add a new color here? Because they got over 20% obese. And then that spread, and then by 2001, here in the home of deep-fried ice cream, they managed to get 25% of the entire population to achieve the exalted state of obesity. Not to be outdone one year later, one year later, one year later. Another new color. Isn't that exciting? 30% spreading throughout the South. 2012. Now look at this. These are what you call optimists. People that made this map because they put another new color on here. Nobody had actually achieved it. There was a heavy competition going on. But then here they managed to come in and get 35%. And if you look at just black folks, uh, they're doing an even more efficient job of increasing strategic fat reserves. Today, there's more people suffering and dying in the world from dietary excess than deficiency. They say there's differences in Europe. <laughs> the diet, the diet differences. I'm proud to say as an American that when it comes to achieving obesity, we're number one. 
We've done a more effective job than anybody else in the world, and when spring comes late, I guess we're going to do just fine in this competition to achieve obesity. It's interesting, here we are with over a third of our population now. Here in Asia, some of these countries, they only have like 3% obesity. It's like they're not even trying. <laughs> Along with obesity goes the diseases of dietary excess. Diseases that used to be rare were called the diseases of kings. Today, they're ubiquitous. Diabetes is an example. And as obesity goes up, so does diabetes in parallel, almost like there's a connection. Today, what we're doing to deal with this is we're telling people to eat health foods. You know, health foods like olive oil and red wine and dark chocolate, coffee and energy drinks, granola bar and all kinds of animal foods. Instead of telling people what they really need to hear, which is they need healthy food, fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. So... How is this happening? What explains why this can be going on? If you think about human beings and you think about how we evolved, we evolved in an environment of scarcity where it was very difficult to get enough to eat and hard to avoid being eaten. In fact, the vast majority of humans ever born on the planet never lived to reproduce. They never passed on their DNA. Only the rare, the few, our ancestors managed to survive. And they survived in large part because they were innovators. Humans figured out how to use tools, how to master fire, and we developed perhaps the, mo perhaps the most powerful tool the planet's ever seen, which is the sophisticated use of language, language that allows us to accumulate and pass on information in a geometric fashion. And these tools were important for our survival, but we still didn't thrive. Our, they say for most of that period of time, from a million years ago to 100,000 years ago, there was about 50 to 100,000 humans. And at times, our species almost went extinct about 70,000 years ago after a very large volcano erupted, but we did survive. It's interesting, if you look at the human brain, this is a modern human brain, and this is a representation of an ancient human brain. There's been no discernible change in the human brain uh, since about 100,000 years ago when humans, uh, for whatever reason, managed to take over from Neanderthals. And presumably, not only is the morphology the same, but the functional capacities are more or less uh, the same, at least for the last 100,000 years. Which means if you took, uh, if you look here on, on this graph, humans got bigger and their brains got bigger up till about 100,000 years ago. So from 5 million years to 100,000 years, there was quite a bit of change, uh, at least in the brain size, and then kind of has leveled off in, that, in this last little small blip of biological time. The implication is that if you took a human infant from today and transported it back to 100,000 years ago, they would not be able to tell the difference. And if you took a human infant from 100,000 years ago and could somehow magically raise it today, you could not tell the difference. That child would be just as annoying as a kid, just as obnoxious as a teenager, would be just as challenging to manage as a child uh, born today because their mental cognitive capacities are essentially what we have right now. But our brains were designed and evolved in an environment of scarcity. They evolved in this environment, not this environment. And the implications of that are quite profound. The way the brain directs the body is neurochemically. So the brain tells the body what to do. And what it's telling the body to do is survive and reproduce. Because those are the essential requirements if the DNA that's driving this whole picture are going to survive. And the way the brain tells the body what to do, how to engage in behaviors that survive, help it survive and reproduce, is in part through this chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is a neurochemical that induces an experience you know of as pleasure. More dopamine, more pleasure. More dopamine, more intense the pleasure. So every time you engage in behavior that favors survival and reproduction in a natural setting, your brain rewards you with dopamine to encourage that behavior. So it's not surprising when you think about what behaviors do human beings need to do in the environment of our ancient ancestors to survive and reproduce, that would be eating and reproducing, food and sex. Food and sex are the natural stimulants of dopamine in human beings. Food and sex, food and sex, food and sex, unless, of course, you are a male human being, then it's entirely different. Then it's sex and food. <laughs> but whether it's food and sex or sex and food, these are the natural, normal stimulants of dopamine production in the brain. But remember I mentioned that those humans were very powerful innovators? Well, they found out there are certain chemicals 
that if you ingest those chemicals, they artificially stimulate this dopamine cascade and induce dopamine production and make you feel good. And we went to inordinate efforts to find each and every chemical that happened to stimulate that cascade. And there's a number of those chemicals that we've discovered. Alcohol, methamphetamines, you can inject materials, you can snort snuff up your nose. Uh, cocaine is particularly interesting because cocaine is one of the most powerful stimulants of dopamine. In fact, if you compare smoking cocaine or, or uh, ingesting cocaine compared to having an orgasm during sex, cocaine generates 10 times more dopamine secretion. I was giving a talk in LA one time and a woman, obviously in her early 80s, maybe older, stood up and she said, excuse me, Dr. Goldhammer, where do I get that cocaine? <laughs> That's not the point. Now, it turns out if that was the only story, we would just say, well, drugs artificially stimulate dopamine production. Don't use drugs. You could become a drug, addict. drug addict. It's a bad thing. Just say no. And if that's all there was to it, the story would be over. It's not, though. It turns out there are certain chemicals that have been discovered that you can put in the feed. And if you put these chemicals, for example, in the feed of uh, mice, those mice will increase their weight 49% in just 60 days. Now, are the mice getting fat because of psychological reasons? Is it, were they stressed? Did the mommy rat didn't love them enough? Or daddy rat loved them too much? Or they weren't disciplined properly as children? Or is it biological? Because they're artificially stimulating the dopamine cascade in their brains and leads to overeating. Um, this works in all animals. In fact, it even works uh, in humans. This is one of the chemicals that you can add to the feed of animals or humans that will artificially stimulate feeding response, C6H1206. You know it as sugar. Sugar works really well as an artificial stimulant of dopamine production. Um, in fact, it works so well that now 150 pounds a year is the average consumption of sugar in the United States. Now, I'm not eating any, which means somebody's eating my sugar. And high fructose corn syrup, a heavily federally subsidized, particularly noxious version of sugar because it processes in the liver much like alcohol, is increased 1,050%. We make this stuff super cheap so that junk food can be highly affordable and highly profitable. Here's another chemical. I'm sure you all recognize this one, CH3, CH27, CH, CH, CH27, COOH. That is, of course oil. And what we do with this is interesting. We want to kind of soak it up. So we put it in vats, cook it up at high temperature, and then stick starches in there and soak the grease up. I, I tell people, instead of eating french fries and potato chips, better what you should do is find the deep fryer, stick your head in it, and suck. Because <laughs> that's essentially what you're doing. It's affecting our adults, it's affecting our children, and it's going to result in an inevitable cascade of death and disability that we'll see before our very eyes in the coming years. Today, the pleasure trap is so pervasive that 93% of all calories consumed are either animal foods or pleasure trap chemicals. Meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy, products, oil, salt, and sugar. Now, I know some of you are vegetarians or vegans, and so you look at this chart and you think, well, wait a second, 7% is still fruits and vegetables. There's still hope. Keep hope alive. I don't mean to rain on your parade, but of that 7%, one-third of it is just one vegetable, potatoes, normally served as french fries or potato chips. Today, fruits and vegetables make the decoration of the plate. They don't even make a statistically significant percentage of the diet of people living in industrialized countries. It's called the pleasure trap, the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. It's why people are fat, sick, and miserable. And escaping the pleasure trap is one of the most difficult challenges people will face in their lifetime, which leads me to the topic that I'm here to speak of today. But first, I'm going to show you a picture of a young girl. She's five years old. She was one of 250 million babies born on this planet five years ago. By coincidence, she happens to be my granddaughter, uh, Kate. And in what is probably the most bizarre statistical anomaly of all time, it turns out that my granddaughter, Kate, was the cutest one of all. <laughs> I at, what are the odds? So, 
Um, I mentioned and I promised that we were going to discuss uh, the concept of high blood pressure since it's one of the leading contributing causes of death and disability and we have such an aggressive treatment program demonstrated here for managing it. We have all kinds of drugs. We have old drugs that are off patent and not very expensive and we have new very expensive drugs. Interestingly enough, the old drugs don't really work better than the new drugs but nonetheless we take these drugs and the promise we make to patients if they take the drugs and follow the advice exactly is they'll never get well that they'll be sick for the rest of their lives and they'll be on the drugs forever. If you have high blood pressure, you will be told you'll be on drugs forever because your doctor will guarantee you, you will never recover. If you have diabetes, you'll be told you'll be on the drugs for the rest of your life. If you have autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, asthma, eczema, psoriasis, you will be sick forever, guaranteed. talk about blood pressure. The systolic blood pressure is the top number when you get your blood pressure measured. It represents the pressure of the blood in the vessels when the heart contracts. The bottom number, diastolic blood pressure, represents the pressure of the blood in the vessels when the heart is in its relaxed phase. And these two numbers are absolutely sensitive indicators of all-cause mortality. They're good predictors of uh, if you're going to die prematurely because they represent um, numbers that represent many different organ systems. In other words, lots of things can make your blood pressure go up, so in order to lower your blood pressure, you have to get rid of whatever the limiting factors are. Today, high blood pressure, leading cause of death and disability, 287,000 people have congestive heart failure. That's where the heart muscle loses integrity and it doesn't pump the blood well. And then, like, if you lie down, your lungs will fill up with fluid. That's why people with congestive heart failure have to sleep sitting up. Um, the leading cause of congestive heart failure, that's high blood pressure. 790,000 people are going to have strokes this year, maybe a little bit more, and that's essentially a brain attack where the brain loses a flow because you form a clot because of the combination of your diet and your blood pressure. Without having hypertension, it's very difficult to have strokes. Most people will develop high blood pressure, which means by the time you're retirement age, if you aren't hypertensive, if you don't have high blood pressure, you're abnormal. Because average or normal people have high blood pressure. You don't want to be normal, you want to be healthy. Healthy people don't have high blood pressure. 38 million people have to visit physicians each year. It's the leading justification for prescription medication. It's worth tens of billions of dollars to the pharmaceutical industry. It's a great disease when you think about it, you, but once you get on the drugs, you have to take them forever. You never get well, you have to just keep using the medications. But the majority of people that have heart attacks and strokes don't take blood pressure medications because they can't be prescribed them because more people would die from the medication than the high blood pressure. In other words, you have to have a certain level of high blood pressure in order to justify the very risks of these dangerous medications that are used. If you give everybody blood pressure medications, more people will die taking the medications than from the blood pressure. That doesn't mean that moderate levels of hypertension aren't dangerous, they are. 138 over 88 doesn't justify medication, but you have five times the risk of dying from a heart attack as a person, everything else being equal, at 110 over 70. And for every point you reduce your blood pressure, one point, your top number, through diet and lifestyle change, it reduces your risk of all-cause mortality, death from any cause, by 1%. That's a very much more sensitive indicator than many of the other measurements we measure, like cholesterol and whatnot. And that risk goes down all the way to 90 over 60. So if your blood pressure is 120 and you adopt a vegan SOS-free diet, SOS stands for the international symbol of danger and it also stands for sugars, oils, and salts. But you'd get all the um, refined carbohydrates and sugars, oils, and salt out of the diet, make it a vegan diet. Um, your blood pressure you can expect to come down to, on average, closer to 90 over 60. And dropping your pressure from 120 to 90 reduces your risk of dying from any cause 30%. What works at lowering blood pressure includes a vegetarian high fiber diet, weight loss, not drinking alcohol, exercising. Now medications do work at lowering blood pressure, but they come at a price. Chronic cough, fatigue, and impotence. And as a consequence, over 50% of people will not take their medications uh, regularly because they don't like the side effects. Um, the John McDougall did a program at St. Helena Hospital. He demonstrated a 17 point drop. And T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University and us at the True North Health Center did a study where we were able to demonstrate 37-point average drop. And if you look at our study where we 
on stage three hypertension where they start at 180 or higher, high enough to justify medication, the average drop was 60 points. 60 points plus whatever effect their medication was having because they started on drugs, they ended up off drugs. In this study, we took 174 consecutive people and 174 people lowered their blood pressure enough to eliminate the need for any medication. Um, that's the largest effect size that's ever been shown in treating high blood pressure in humans. Um, after we got that um, study published with the help of Dr. Campbell, we were approached by the International Union of Operating Engineers, large labor union, and they were interested in making our program a fully covered medical benefit for this major labor union in California. And so Dr. Lyle and I went down and we talked to the people that hire the guys that build the highways and do all that stuff. And after a rather entertaining conversation, um, they decided to make our program a fully covered medical benefit. Uh, when we were at the meeting uh, presenting this data, a few things were interesting. They had a lot of people there. Some people represented the, the crane operators. They had some crane operators there. They had people representing the employers that hired them. They had a National Institute of Health reviewer there that analyzes data. They had an actuary there that calculates the pension benefits of the union guys. And we presented this data. And then the first objections were from the employers that said that they really didn't think it was reasonable to have to send people on vacations after they already spend so much money on health care. And then I described what happens when people go through fasting. And after a while, they decided maybe it wasn't exactly a vacation. <laughs> the NIH reviewer was very favorable. He said he thought that the cost of treating hypertension and diabetes was so high that if they did this program, it would result in cost savings. Um, and then the funniest part was that a little guy who had been running numbers the whole time, the actuary stood up and said, Dr. Goldhammer, if we do this program and it works, won't it increase their retirement costs by making them live longer? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. And then a guy stood up, and I knew immediately he was a crane operator because his neck was a lot bigger than my thigh. And he said, listen, little man, you should remember who you work for. You work for us. Why don't you calculate how much money we'll save when I come back there and break your neck? <laughs> and then they voted unanimously to make our program a fully covered medical benefit for any member of the union or their family that had diabetes or high blood pressure. And they asked us to do a study to see whether it actually resulted in cost savings. And so we um, took the first 30 people that they uh, sent to us with high blood pressure and or diabetes, and we put them through a program, and we carefully uh, measured their results, and then we followed those people for a year. Um, they lost 26 pounds in an average three-week stay, and at one year follow-up, they were down an average of 28 pounds. So they had maintained most of the results, got a little bit more improvement. Not as much as I would have liked, but they did pretty well. They maintained their blood pressure, and most importantly, the union calculated that they saved more money in the first year than the entire cost of the program because of the reduction in cost for medications and, and the like. So the, 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 they were very happy, and we went on for over a decade to provide service to these union operators. Now, the, the best, uh, I always love this story, is the very first gentleman they sent me. This was when we just started the program. There had been no information on it. They just had a guy, his blood pressure was 220 over 120, he was on a bunch of meds. They wouldn't let him drive the cranes anymore. And they said, you have to go to this place and they'll help you get over your blood pressure. And he assumed he'd be getting yet one more medication or whatever, he wasn't sure. But he showed up having no idea <laughs> what he was getting into at the True North Health Center. And he was walking around and he said, what am I doing here? And I said, oh, well, you're here to get well. And he said, I'm not sick. I said, well, yes, you are. He says, no, I'm not. And I said, yes, you're sick. You have high blood pressure. You have diabetes. You got that keg on your belly. And I thought I'd get his attention. I said, and I think you're going to die. And he says, well, don't we all have to die? I said, well, yeah, but you're on $800 a month of medications, and you may not need those if we get you healthy. And he says, what do I care? I don't pay for the drugs the union does. And that's when I realized this wasn't my normal, highly motivated conscientious individual. <laughs> Wasn't exactly sure, like, what do you do? And, and then I was thinking about his medical history, and do you know what happens to many males that are on hypertensive and diabetes medications? Yeah. So I said, hey, if we get you off all those drugs, there's a pretty good chance we can do something about your little problem. He started to stand up, and I was thinking, that wasn't a good idea, because he was a big guy. And I thought, uh-oh. And he said, well, why the hell didn't you just say so? So he's checking in his room, 
Now, the problem is, his diet diary told me that he ate basically this. Well, not exactly this. I couldn't find a picture of exactly what he eats. But it's this without this disgusting slice of green vegetable material at the top. Because he would lift up the bun if they, you know, if they put it on there and get rid of that. So he wasn't exactly a vegan, SOS-free, health-promoting diet uh, advocate. So we thought, well, we'll feed him a bit before we put him on the fast, because we don't want to have him fast with this stuff turning into concrete in his colon. So we sat him down to eat some food, and I thought, oh my gosh, we must have missed his diagnosis. It looks like he has a tumor, because he's like... And I sat down, and I said, it looks like you're having a little bit of trouble with the food. And he said, what food? He said, this is not food. He said, this is disgusting. He says, if I have to eat tasteless swill like this the rest of my life, I'd rather just die. He said, why don't you go out to my truck? There's a 12 gauge in there. You can bring it in and when I'm not looking, just shoot me in the head. <laughs> so we checked him in. We put him on a fast and 26 days of water only fasting later, he was off his high blood pressure medications, his diabetes medications, he's lost 40 pounds, and he was coming off the fast, and so it was time to start eating, and we gave him some more of the same food, and now he was actually able to eat it. And when I sat down next to him, I said, oh, it looks like you're doing a little better now with the food. He said, yeah, your damn chef's finally getting the hang of it. <laughs> Took me 20 minutes to convince him it was the same food. <laughs> he said, no, that stuff you tried to make me swallow when I came in was disgusting. He said, this stuff's not bad. Taste no adaptation. After we signed the union contract, the California Board of Medical Quality Assurance became concerned that chiropractic quacks were starving people. And so they sent in undercover investigators to come to our facility, posed as patients, and they collected lots of information. Interestingly enough, the reports were really quite favorable. <laughs> but uh, in any case, they sent out an investigator. And I'm not saying he's an alcoholic because that would be slander. But you know how people get that hyperemic look, you know, when they drink too much and you kind of see it across the room and you kind of know they're like drinking quite well. He had that look just, I'm sure, coincidentally. And he said, uh, he, he came up and w kind of waddled in from the parking lot. He was already out of breath when he got to the building. And he said uh, that he was very uncomfortable with what he'd heard about us. And I said, well, I can see you're very uncomfortable. And he said, where did you get the idea that it was okay to do this fasting business? And I said, well, you know, I read this book and these four guys did it, you know, Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus. I thought, what the hell, you know? Because <laughs> he obviously made up his mind. He said, oh, that's irrelevant. And he said that uh, he was, you know, his responsibility was to make sure that inappropriate things weren't taking place. And I said, well, why don't you check in? You clearly could use it. And we'll fast you for 30 or 40 days. And when we're done, you won't be such a fat, miserable human being. Now, as I said that, who walks in the door? Our psychologist, Dr. Lyle. Just when I'm... And he's like, deer in the headlights, looking at me. He knows the guys from the government. And he says, oh, excuse us. And he takes me outside. He tells me I'm being socially inappropriate and failing to establish rapport. <laughs> and that he would complete the conversation with the gentleman. He talked to him. A week later, the sheriff showed up with the subpoenas. We went through a whole uh, rig and roll. The, the board had decided that recommending fasting constituted such a gross violation of the standard of medical practice that it rose to the level of criminal negligence. So I had to hire a criminal defense attorney. He asked me what I had done wrong. And I said, I don't do anything. And he says, oh, yeah, that's what they all say. He uh, reviewed the case and he said not to worry about it, that the medical board mostly f fluff and bluster and all we had to do was agree not to do any more fasting and it would all go away. And I said, well, we can't really do that. Kind of that's what we do. And he says, well, it's not going to work. You're going to go, you know, they're going to drag this thing out for two years. You're going to lose your license. Even if you win in court, they can ignore the ruling because it's just advisory in the state of California. The medical board has absolute authority over medical practice. And then you can sue in civil court, but even if you win there, they'll give you so much trouble. Just agree not to do any fasting and it'll be done. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time and, and your money. Um, so we didn't know what to do, so we called uh, the union. And I asked the guy, I said, uh, you know, we've got this problem. Can you help us? And he laughed at me. He said, oh, yeah. So we'll look into it. And I get a call the next day from my attorney. He said, who do you know? I just got a call. They said that if you agree to pay a fine to cover the investigative costs and save face of the board, it'll all go away. And 
So ultimately, that's what we did. We paid a fine. They decided it wasn't criminal negligent behavior, and everything went away. And now they don't bother us anymore. But you know, um, I was the first person in my family ever to need the services of a criminal defense attorney. It made my mother so proud. <laughs> so what we do is fasting. Now you're going to hear a whole lot of stuff now about fasting, intermittent fasting, modified fasting, calorie restriction. Because there's a lot of research coming out right now, and people like Walter Longo and Matson and Luigi Fontana are publishing in the scientific literature, and it's getting into the lay literature. And the reason is that calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, modified fasting, these different protocols are very effective at doing a lot of things like helping people with weight loss. Some of these things involve, for example, narrowing the feeding window so you don't eat, say, before 8 or 9 or 10 in the morning, you don't eat after 5. So you narrow the amount of feeding. So there's a longer period of fasting, a longer period of fat burning. Helps people with weight loss techniques. Sometimes you'll eat a healthy diet, but one day a week you might reduce your total caloric load to five or 600 calories. And again, facilitating fat mobilization. These are wonderfully useful tools. That's not what we're talking about today. Today what we're talking about is complete total water-only fasting for periods of five to 40 days in a medically supervised setting. This is a unique physiological adaptation and it's different than starving. People a lot of times equate fasting and starving. Fasting is when you have labile reserves. Starving is when you've depleted your labile reserves and you continue to fast, enter starvation, and then you die. So we don't do that because that would really screw up our long-term outcome data. So we're very careful to avoid the starving. We stick within the fasting. Indications for fasting are interesting. When people get sick or animals get sick, they lose their appetite. That's a loss of appetite, one of the most obvious indications for fasting. It can be used in acute and chronic illness. It can be used to speed healing. It can be used to change behaviors. For example, smoking. Most smokers by the second or third day have no cravings. Now, some people say it's because they're so miserable fasting they're not thinking about the cigarettes, but that's not really the case. It's because the metabolites are processed so quickly, withdrawal is greatly facilitated. And psychospiritually, it's interesting that there's no religious tradition I've ever heard of that doesn't have some kind of tradition about fasting. From the Jains to the Jews to the Buddhists to the Muslims, everybody's got some kind of tradition about fasting. And for a reason, because fasting changes the way you think and feel about yourself and the world around you. Um, patient selection is important. Not everybody's a good candidate for fasting. We determine that with a complete medical history, physical exam and laboratory evaluation. It's really important with fasting that you have good baseline data so you can tell the difference between a healing crisis, a positive attempt by the body to get well, and a problem, because we don't want any problems. The experience of fasting uh, is interesting. You get a foul taste in your mouth. It tastes like something may crawl in there and die. Sometimes increased body odor and fatigue, sleep disturbance, restlessness, irritability, dizziness, aches and pains, nausea, vomiting, rashes, discharges, heightened senses, and a healing crisis where sometimes it makes you feel kind of like you're dying. These symptoms are all positive attempts generated by the body in order to attempt to get well. But for people not familiar with fasting, sometimes they don't sound so pleasant. <laughs> I, I learned that early on when we had a patient referred by a medical doctor in Clear Lake. And he uh, sent this patient in with, uh, she had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, she had hypertension, she was on a lot of medication. And she told me that her doctor was somebody she really had confidence in. And that's why she was coming to us, because he said we could help her. And she said, he's a bit of a practical joker and has a very good sense of humor. And he told me that what you were going to do is put me in a room and not feed me for two weeks. <laughs> she thought that was the funniest thing. She told her it would be at least three. <laughs> and she says, well, nothing at all? Just water? That's it. For three weeks. What would happen to me? I said, well, you'd mouth it tastes like something crawled in there and died. And then you'd smell bad and get irritable and you may have some aches and pains and nausea and vomiting and rashes and discharges and heightened senses and you may have a healing crisis where you think you're going to die. And she said, well, my, you're quite a salesman, aren't you? Where do I sign up? As it turns out, she fasted for 26 days. She actually had a relatively uneventful fast. And um, when she went back to see her medical doctor in Clear Lake, she walked in his office and he was amazed because she had lost all this weight, she was off the drugs, she was out of pain, she looked like a different person. And he immediately called me on the phone with her sitting next to him and he said, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in 25 years of practice. He says, the only thing I don't understand is she says you fasted her for 26 days on water only. How the hell did you do that? 
And I thought I'd give him a hard time. So I said, well, you know, she was so reluctant, we finally realized the only hope was to tie her up. <laughs> and he says, you did not. And then he turned to her and said, did they tie you up? And she said, oh, no, not till after the second week. <laughs> he quit his job. He joined our staff till he retired from medicine because he wanted to spend the final years doing something worthwhile with his life. Duration of fasting ranges from a few days to a few weeks, and sometimes it may take several fasts to resolve a given problem. And it's not always possible to say exactly how long it's going to go, except in hindsight. I'm really good in hindsight. So I'm saying that the leading cause of death and disability, things like metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, diabetes, are better treated with fasting than anything else we know. How is that possible? How could something as simple and natural as fasting give the body a chance to recover from so many of these serious illnesses? What are possible mechanisms? Well, what percentage of our patients, of the 15,000 people that have undergone fasting at the True North Health Center in the last 30 years, what percentage do you think lost some weight? 10%? 20%? 100%. Yeah, it sounds kind of like quackery stuff, 100% effective system. But the laws of physics and thermodynamics tell you that if you don't eat, you're going to lose weight. And you're going to lose weight at the rate of about a pound a day. Naturesis is a selective elimination from sodium in the body. It happens in everybody that fasts. It's very powerful, more powerful than a diuretic. And so the fluid comes off, the blood volume goes down, the blood pressure goes down, the swelling, the edema. It's very powerful. Detoxification was the traditional justification for fasting. This was why people used to think people would fast, because they had this idea that there were toxins in the body. Are there really toxins in the body? You betcha. Toxins accumulate within the cells of the body. They come from various sources. The leading source of toxins in most people is eating animal foods, meat, fish, fowlies, and dairy products that biologically accumulate and concentrate the toxins from the environment in their tissues. When you kill and eat the animal, it accumulates in you so that you get an entire lifetime of toxins in every mouthful of meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products. Um, autophagy is the process where the body actually sends in the immune system to get rid of uh, materials that build up in the cells, materials that are thought to be part of the aging process. There are two types of toxins, exogenous and endogenous. Exogenous toxins are things that shouldn't be there. PCB, dioxin, heavy metals, pesticide residues, chemicals, stuff that shouldn't even be in the environment. It is and it builds up in us. The other are endogenous toxins, normal intermediary products of metabolism, uric acid, cholesterol, different things that are normal. They're not really toxins per se, but when they accumulate excessively, they can interfere with cellular function, lead to disease, debility, and ultimately death. These are reversed in fasting. In fact, some people criticize fasting. They say fasting is good, but it's so good that this happens so quickly that you're going to overwhelm the body's ability to keep up with the detoxification, so you shouldn't do it, unless you take their expensive proprietary products, and then, of course, it's perfectly fine. Uh, multipotential hemopoietic stem cells are the kind of the core baseline cells of your body. You hear a lot about stem cells and stuff like that. Well, these cells become the other cells. These cells can transform into myeloblasts and natural killer cells and eosinophils and basophils and, you know, the macrophages, all the things that protect your body. It, it's, it's thought that part of the aging process is when these multipotential hemopoietic stem cells deteriorate or become damaged or die, that's partly what aging and ultimately death is. For example, in, in, in melanin cells, when, you, when those cells lose their integrity, you're, you will no longer produce melanin. What happens to your hair? It turns gray. Exactly. And so the hair uh, multipotential cells that make melanin lose their integrity, so that there's no more melanin, so then you see the natural underlying color of hair, which is great. Okay, so the problem is hemopoietic stem cell function as a major source of morbidity and mortality was thought to be irreversibly damaged by aging, that it was just a one-way path. And then they did a bunch of research in rats, and they, it, they can double the lifespan in rats just with periodic fasting. And they're trying to figure out, well, what is it that's happening in the rats so they live twice as long if they use fasting? And one of the theories is that by reversing the aging process with hemopoietic stem cells, you're slowing the aging process down. The sensitivity of hemopoietic stem cells to the toxic effect of chemotherapy is a major roadblock to cancer therapy. Cancer therapy is based on this. Uh, cancer cells have higher metabolic rates, so they're more vulnerable to radiation than healthy cells. So if you give enough radiation, for example, or chemotherapy and kill all the cancer cells, you solve the cancer. 
The problem is if you give enough to get all the cancer cells, usually you kill the host. And so that because the sensitivity to um, cancer cells is greater, the, the hope was if it could get just the right amount of poison, you could kill the cancer cells without killing the, the host cells. Well, it turns out in fasting, healthy cells are protected and cancer cells are even more vulnerable, as we'll learn, to the effects of conventional therapy. Recent research shows that prolonged fasting can rejuvenate old hemopoietic stem cells and protect these hemopoietic stem cells from the toxic effects of chemotherapy. Prolonged fasting represents a profound way to reverse aging of the immune system and enhance cancer treatment, according to Journal of Metabolism 2014 by Walter Longo and Mattson. Um, the cancer theories involve DSR and DSS. Differential stress resistance involves the fact that during fasting, uh, oncogenes are negatively regulate stress resistance, which means that cancer cells are more vulnerable in an environment of nutritional stress than healthy cells are because of their increased metabolic rates. And DSF, differential stress sensitization with, um, or excuse me, DSS, cancer cells are more vulnerable to uh, stress. DSR, healthy cells are protected in fasting. Healthy cells, because of um, various antioxidant cascades that happen in fasting, healthy cells are protected. The combination of this means um, research done by um, Longo found that took 30 rats with cancer, radiated enough to kill all the cancer cells, kills all the rats. Take the same rats, same cancer, same kind of treatment, but this time you fast the rats, the rats survive. Yeah, interesting. And now they're starting to do it uh, in humans. And that's become actually relatively more common where they're using fasting, brief periods of fasting before, during, and after uh, chemotherapy radiation to augment, to accentuate, to benefit uh, outcomes. Chemotherapy combined with fasting results in dramatically higher cancer-free survival than chemotherapy alone. They've also got studies that have not been published yet that show the genomics of cancer turn off just with fasting. Okay. You won't see that stuff published too long because almost everybody's working for drug companies looking for what are called fasting mimics. They want to find out what's the biochemistry of fasting and then come up with a drug that mimics it. Okay, beta-hydroxybutyric is the fatty acid that's produced when fat is broken down and that's the fuel that's predominant in your brain. And the presence of that in, in fasting provides antioxidant and rejuvenate benefits to mitochondrial function, that's the energy components of the cells, and results in efficient ATP production and it enhances antiviral immunity. It turns out a lot of these persistent viral infections, not amenable to antibiotics or conventional treatment, seem to respond to the immune system in the fasting state, even though they don't in the fed state. In, in lower eukaryotes, it's interesting, if you take simple organisms and put them into an environment of normal nutrient media, they live to a certain time. If you take those same organisms and put them into a nutrient media with no nutrition in a fasting state, they live four times as long because they go into this kind of hibernation mode and it's uh, apparently some evolutionary benefit to kind of hang around until food shows up again. In rodents, it, uh, fasting protects against diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and neurodegeneration damage to the nervous system. They're thinking this may be helpful at preventing things like Alzheimer's uh, disease. In humans, it, it, there's studies showing it reduced obesity, high blood pressure, asthma, and RA. This which is, is cited in this Journal of Metabolism article in 2014 is the studies that we did with T. Colin Campbell at True North Health Center. And of course, I always evaluate somebody else's intelligence by to the degree that they agree with me. So because he put our studies in his, in his research that went into this major journal, I think he's brilliant. Fasting delays aging by protecting against the disease of dietary excess and reversing every aspect of metabolic syndrome. So you heard about a, uh, a brief reference earlier to a woman that we had at the center. She's announced this publicly, and we've uh, actually submitted this case report to the British Medical Journal, which has, interestingly enough, accepted it for review. It looks like they're going to publish it. This was a 42-year-old female diagnosed with follicular lymphoma, stage 3. She'd been tracked for two years at Stanford. She'd had a biopsy, spiral CT, been well-documented and well-established. The problem with this condition is this type of cancer doesn't respond well to conventional treatment with chemotherapy and radiation, so they're not that anxious to go in and do it because the treatment doesn't work. So they've been tracking her, but it had progressed. She had you know, easily palpated lemon-sized uh, tumors uh, throughout her body. 
Uh, CT measured it, 34 by 20, 22 by 16. She underwent her biopsies. Flow cytometry, so it's CD positive. Mono B cells making up 15% of the specimen. Not much question about this diagnosis. She did not feel good. So she asked her, or her regular doctor about alternatives, who absolutely assured her there was nothing to do with diet when she asked him. Diet, you could eat whatever you wanted. Diet had no relationship to this condition. And when she queried him about fasting, he said, no, that was criminal quackery, essentially. Um, so she went to the uh, oncologist, who wasn't quite as harsh, but said there wasn't, diet wasn't part of the course, and you know, she, she had different options of treatment available. So she decided with that type of medical encouragement to come and fast at the True North Health Center. She underwent 21 days of water-only fasting and 10 days of refeeding. Now, why would she do that? Well, it turns out she had a relative with rheumatoid arthritis that had also been told nothing could be done and diet didn't matter who had been successfully treated uh, and recovered. And although it hadn't motivated her to adopt the diet at the time, it certainly stuck in her mind. So at this point, she did come in. She fasted for 21 days. And during that time, her lesions completely disappeared. So we sent her back to her oncologist at Stanford. And she told me he did a little bit of the double take when he first examined her, looking for the lesions that had been there a month before that he couldn't find. And, you know, he's checking the chart and checking her, and he asked her, what, did, what happened? And she said, oh, I went to the quacks, and I did the starvation treatment, and, you know. And he said, really? I'm going to have to give them a call. So what we did, um, and he assured her, though, that you can't cure this condition, that she still had neutropenia, low white blood count, and not to get uh, her hopes up. But at two months, at three months, at six months, and then by nine months, not only had she complied, witnessed her weight loss continue to drop, but her white count also normalized, and now she's at 11 months and, and doing very, very well. This is the before and after radiographs of her right inguinal lesion. You can see this lesion disappeared. And then this is the other one, uh, before and after. This is a chart showing that the most significant thing here is you can see she's actually complying. She's eating the diet. Because you understand, there is no cure for obesity. If you lose the weight and go back to a greasy, slimy, fatty, dead, decaying flesh diet, you're going to get fat again. And there is no cure for hypertension. If you go back to a salty, fatty, greasy, slimy, dead, decaying flesh diet, your blood pressure is going to eventually go back again. And there is no cure for diabetes. If you go back to the things that cause the problem, it's going to recur. You can manage these conditions in some cases with diet and lifestyle change with fasting. But you still have to actually do the diet and lifestyle change because it's not a, quote, cure. It's just a management strategy. But she's been compliant. She's continued to make progress, and she continues to feel well. She'll be ready shortly for her next fast. Uh, enzymes are important substances. They do two things for you. They mobilize nutrient reserves like fat. Like, have you ever thought, how do you turn your fat into energy? Through lipolysis, an enzymatically driven process. You need enzyme systems. Well, those enzyme systems are induced during fasting. And after you induce those pathways, they persist. So every time somebody fasts, they get better and better at actualizing, just like a, an athlete. Every time you exercise, you mobilize the glycogen storage pathways. We have to wrap up the presentation. Wrap up the presentation, OK? How much time, how much time do we have? I'm done. Okay. Well, okay. Well, let Okay. En enzymes that are ne need to mobilize fats and proteins also are needed to do detoxification. And when you go on a fast, you induce your detoxifying enzyme pathways, and those enzyme pathways persist, which means even when you're not fasting, you're doing a better job of mobilizing and eliminating these systems. BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is the protective factor that protects the brain from conditions like Alzheimer's disease. And it is induced during two things we know of. Number one is exercise. People that exercise regularly have higher BDNF, and the other is fasting. Fasting induces these uh, uh, mechanisms that help with neuronal resistance to injury. All BDNF mediates fasting response also includes appetite and autonomic control. That's why after fasting, a lot of that constant cravings and hungers and apostatic problems are sorted out. It's like rebooting the hard drive in a computer. Turn the computer off, turn it back on, it, 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 it clears corruption. 
Insulin is a hormone that drives sugar from the blood to the, string, to the cells. Fasting reduces insulin resistance, which is why fasting seems to be so effective in treating diabetes. Fasting also helps get rid of gut leakage. You have a tunnel that goes through the body. Nothing gets in unless, just like a screen protects the fly on the window, but if the screen is damaged, flies get in and materials leak through your gut. The cause of this gut leakage is free radicals. We see the effect of free radicals. You see the effect of free radicals. This is the case of somebody using methamphetamine. Makes you want to run out and use a bunch of meth, doesn't it? You could look like this too. So um, the fasting heals the gut leakage by resolving the inflammation. And so then it helps deal with the autoimmune diseases that are triggered by the gut leakage. Fasting normalizes the autonomic nervous system. It has a psychospiritual impact. It enhances the immune system. Um, and it has taste and adaptation. It actually allows the body to taste good foods again. That, remember my union guy? Disgusting, swill, he wouldn't have even complied for a meal. After fasting, the food's not bad. Taste and adaptation. Now good foods start to taste good because if you don't like good foods, that means you're an addict. You're addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in your brain. The way you solve addiction is getting free of it. Fasting is a helpful way of breaking free of addiction. So in summary, Fasting decreases glucose and IGF-1, one of the aging factors. It decreases blood pressure, in decreases insulin, inflammation, total microbial load. It increases leptin, the satiety hormone. It increases insulin, cellular stress resistance, cellular stress adaptation, autophagy. It normalizes gut microbiota. It stimulates B cell immunity. It reverses all major abnormalities of metabolic syndrome. For those of you that have questions, I'm going to be here out with um, the book people's table with our book, The, the uh, Pleasure Trap, the Health Promoting Cookbook, and the Bravo Cookbook, vegan SOS free cookbooks that actually have recipes that taste good that even I can make. If you have questions, please come and ask me. If you don't get to ask me here, I have cards. You can call me. I'll talk to you on the phone. We offer free consultations uh, for phone through the Truth Health Center uh, and invite you uh, to take advantage of that. We have a website at healthpromoting.com where everything we have is uh, freely available. And uh, for those of you that are interested in learning more about the research that we're doing, um, we have a 501c3 nonprofit called the True North Health Foundation that's actively involved in doing research and public education. Thank you very much for your attention.